Welcome to Finding Contentment, the official podcast of the American Institute of Stress. The goal of this podcast is to explore the science, psychology and practical wisdom that can help us manage our stress. If you are looking for personal growth and professional success, or just want a more fulfilling life, visit us at stress.org. And now here is the host and executive director of the American Institute of Stress, Will Heckman. Hey, greetings, everyone. Welcome back to Finding Contentment, the official podcast of the American Institute of Stress. I'm your host and executive director. It's Will Heckman. I'm glad you came back again today. Hey, I want to remind everybody that if you go to stress.org, you can subscribe to our magazines, Contentment and Combat Stress, absolutely free. All you got to do is visit us again at stress.org. And speaking of subscribing, you know I'm going to ask you to. So why don't you go ahead and make me feel good. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Uh, we're trying to get our subscribers up and and uh, makes me feel good. All right. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about a very important topic. We're going to be talking about PTSD. And uh, obviously, we've talked about this before, but it is never enough conversation about this. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's a mental health condition that can develop in some individuals after experiencing or witnessing um, a traumatic event. And, and the traumatic events can lead to PTSD, uh, PTSD include, but are not limited to, combat exposure, but also physical and sexual assaults, accidents, natural disasters. I'm here in Florida, lived through a hurricane. Uh, it could be a terrorist attack. It could be a sudden death of a loved one. So there's a lot of different things that can cause the onset of PTSD. And those things can significantly impact a person's daily life. Also, their relationships, their overall well-being. It's essential for individuals who experience symptoms of PTSD to seek professional help from mental health professionals, such as a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and hopefully they can provide appropriate diagnosis and treatment, which may include therapy and in some cases medication. That's why you talk to them. But I will tell you that early intervention and support are crucial for managing and recovering from PTSD. All right, so today we're very lucky. I have a very, very cool guest today, Mike Hall. Uh, some of you are going to recognize him from uh, some of the TV shows he did. But following his long career in military and intelligence and law enforcement, Mike is a uh, still a first responder. He's a fire rescue uh, volunteer in the New York Hudson Valley. He's a freelance historian and a writer, and a very good one. And has published 10 novels and with publishers, including Penguin, Random House, and Macmillan. And his newest book, The Killing Ground, Biography of Thermophily. I have to learn how to say that correctly, Mike. Uh, which he co-authored with Michael Livingston. is coming from Bloomsbury sometime in 2024. And also you can find Mike's shorter works because they've appeared in New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, The Daily Beast, Foreign Policy, The New Republic, McSweeney, Slate bunch of others he's also starred in tv shows on cbs and discovery and was recently featured in npr uh, mike did his undergrad undergrad work at in university of buffalo and he also has a, holds a master's degree in museum studies uh, and he's cu currently as he tells me pursuing a chaplaincy certificate in soto zen buddhist tradition uh, at the new york zen center for contemplative care which is very cool. And hopefully we can touch on that a little bit. By the way, if you want, of course, you can find his books at mikecole.com and it's M-Y-K-E cole.com. Or as I always say, we can always find it on Amazon. <laughs> so join me in welcoming my guest, Mike Cole. Mike, it's good to have you, man. Thanks yeah, for thanks being so here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. You know, I, I read that biography and I have to tell everyone that that's like a 10th. <laughs> I couldn't I'm I'm reading your stuff on your website and all the other stuff written about you and all the things you've done I'm going no I I that's the whole show I I could just read your biography forever and that would be it like uh Very so forgive me if I left out anything really important but <laughs> <laughs> I think we hit all the highlights thank you very much I I wanted to ask you I I know you've done a lot of things and and I wanted to ask you about what you're doing now, but I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your backstory. 
and how I know you personally were diagnosed with PTSD in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about that and how that came about? Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, I, at the time, was an intelligence officer and was deploying to Iraq. Um, and, uh, you know, I won't get into details of it, but I come from a, a, a family life that was probably a little bit less than ideal. Um, and, uh, I, I was exhibiting symptoms that my friends and family were really concerned about when I was, when I was coming back. And one of the points I made actually in the essay I wrote for your magazine in 2013 was that on the um, Armed Forces Network, AFM, which was sort of our main television network in Iraq, we kept seeing these, and I, and I want to be clear, these are certainly some people's experience with PTSD, that you have these sudden flashbacks, you, you have uh, dramatic episodes um, that are triggered by the backfiring of a car or, right. you know, seeing something on TV, but that was never my experience. And so, of course, I didn't think I had PTSD, right? You know, I was just sort of having this slow erosion of my connectivity to other people, of my ability to take pleasure in life. And, uh, you know, we always liken it to a frog being boiled one degree at a time. If you would, every, every hour you raise the temperature of the water one degree and the frog gets used to it. Mm. And, and then he doesn't realize that he's boiling to death until it's too late. And that was really my experience is that by the time my, my friends and my family were saying, Hey, Mike, what's going on with you? I had a very typical reaction. What are you talking about? I'm fine. This is just my life. Right. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, I was confronted by my brother and my father and my best friend at the time who were just like, you need help. We are really worried about you. And, uh, <laughs> this sounds crazy in retrospect, but I was like, I got to go back to the rack one more time. <laughs> and, and if it doesn't get better, then I'll get help. Because that'll make it better. Oh, I was just yeah. insane, right? But right. but this is, of course, you know, how it goes. Um, actually, uh, let me uh, caveat. I, I used, I said it was insane. Um, I, I don't, I want to be clear. I'm not being pejorative uh, about that mm -hmm. term. Um, uh, we're being, um, we're using plain language here. I'm speaking conversationally with you, but it is important that we keep checking in on the use of those kinds of words because, um, you know, making someone feel like they've, they've got a problem that they need to be ashamed of is not how we're going to deal with this thing. So I, would, yeah, I thank you. Good we, point. you know, I'm not going to retract the word. We're, we're just talking here as friends, right. but that's important that we check in on these things. Okay. So, um, so I went to Iraq and I'll never forget. Um, I, I got off shift because I was a targeting officer down there. Oh, and I want to be clear. You know, I wasn't a pipe hitter. I wasn't kicking down doors. You know, that wasn't something I was doing. I was a targeting officer. I was sending in drone strikes. I was, you know, if, if a direct action team hit a target, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger, but I pulled that trigger by, by giving the order, right? right. By Remotely. working that target. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I certainly went out with teams on targets. Um, but I want to be very clear to your audience. Like I was not getting up close and personal and, and, and shooting people. Um, and that's important because people have this tendency to think, well, you're not a hard operator. How could you ever, you know, have PTSD to which my response is, yeah, working as an interrogator in a prison CIE too. <laughs> if I never go back in a, in a, in a uh, prison again, it'll be, it'll be too soon. Right. Um, but I'll never forget. I walked back. Uh, it was probably like, three, four in the morning to get like an hour or two sleep before I was back on shift in my targeting cell. Um, and a lot of people think of Iraq as a desert. It isn't. <laughs> I mean, two thirds of it are. Um, but uh, the the part where the people live is, I mean, look like Montana where I was in Bilal. Really? You know, really tall grass. Yeah. Because you have two river valleys, right? You have the two right, right, right. So it's just, and, and in the winter, it's just monsoon. It's just rain. So you have this mud, um, I, I'm sure people are familiar with the crisis at Burning Man that just happened. Yeah. So you're probably familiar with the videos of the mud that goes up to your knee and will suck your boot off. That was what it was like. And I came back and I remember lying down in that mud, face down. And Iraqi mud, at least when I was over there, it's not clean. It's not regular mud. You don't want to be lying in that. Uh, and I lay face down in it. And I just thought it was one of the most, it was the, one of the few like truly breaks with reality where I wasn't in control of my behavior that I've ever had. And I thought, believed, if I just lie here, I'll die. Mm. I won't get up again. Um, and, wow. and, 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 and it wasn't even a feeling of grief or sadness. It was a feeling of such profound exhaustion that I just want this to stop. 
Um, and, and of course I lay there <laughs> by some miracle, no first sergeant discovered me and that would have been bad. So I, I got up just coated with this disgusting mud, went back to my hooch, showered off. And of course, at that point made the promise to myself, I think I had another two months left in my tour. And I was like, when I get home. Yeah. And then <laughs> this is the funniest part. When you, when you fly back in, so you, you fly on what's called a rotator. So you fly out of VVIP on a, on a C-130, and then you get to Germany, and you switch to a commercial airplane, mm-hmm. and then you fly into to Dulles. And when you get off, you, you're off to see the wizard, as we said. So you're checking with a with a mental health professional. And when you hold a TSSCI clearance, like we all did in this business, sorry, that's a top secret special compartment. One of the things you never do is admit to a mental health issue because you don't want to lose it. Um, and that's actually a false belief uh, uh, because they really don't, at least certainly now, then it was probably a little more iffy, but now they don't, they don't, they're, they're very, very careful. So, and I want to say that to people who hold clearances, right. you can seek help. You're not going to lose your clearance. Um, in fact, the only thing my, I did have to be interviewed by a security officer and, and he said, are you going to be sitting in the corner going, and I said, no, sir. He said, are you going to hurt yourself or anybody else? I said, no, sir. He said, you do need to sign here. And you waive your right to privacy. I do have the right to interview your doctor and get your medical record. Sorry, you have access to classified information. That's how this goes. And I signed it. That was the end of it. It was no problem. Hmm. And I, That's I interesting that you have to give up your HIPAA rights in order to keep your clearance. But I would think that if you experience some really traumatic events and you said, no, that didn't really bother me, I would think something's wrong with you. Yeah, well, for sure. But the thing so funny is, like, go talk to this doctor. And it's this poor bored guy is like, did you experience anything traumatic? Do you feel like you need help? Because everyone says no. And, you know, and it's just like a rubber stamp. And he goes, did you experience anything traumatic? And I'm like, yes. He goes, great. Do you feel that you need assistance? And I go, yes. And you see him go, like, he's going to go on to the next question. He goes, you do? You do? And he's he's all excited. Um, And that was the beginning of it. Like that was when I began to get treatment and get diagnoses. And what's so interesting with hidden disabilities like PTSD is, you know, your arm's not cut off, right? You can't see it, right? And especially when you look at me, like I'm very healthy and you were just talking about my resume and I'm very successful and have lots of um, stuff going on. So, you know, people sort of look at you and and they're like, well, you know, what's wrong with you? Um, And you also start to think, well, there's no way this can be measured or quantified. Maybe I'm making it up. But nope, there is a very robust and developed medical infrastructure. There are ways that uh, it can be diagnosed. And once you start going down that path, you can get treated. You really can. And what's great is that it's changed a lot. In the last 20 years, 30 years, yeah. 30 yeah. years ago, um, they wouldn't have even used the term PTSD. They, uh, you know, shell shock. Went through, yeah, shell shock, you know. You just, and, and not even in combat, but, you know, as you yourself said, you know, you don't, your particular case, it was in Iraq, but a lot of other people, it, you can uh, suffer from this going through a traumatic event that happens in your house. And they wouldn't have called it that. And now they're really starting to recognize it. And it, I think it's very, very spot on that you call it the, it's like an invisible, can't really tell. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, My well, I, I think that it might be that the technical term is hidden disability. Right. Um, but that's just the Iraq portion. You know, when I, uh, in fact, I, I'm a service-connected disabled veteran, and when I put in, and boy, you want to get diagnosed and go through scrutiny, file for your VA benefits. Yeah. When you do that, they are, there's a microscope. They are making really sure right. that this is real. Because now um, we're talking money. Oh, yeah. Uh, and But for that, because my time in Iraq was as a mercenary with uh, with various private military contractors, and then later as a paramilitary civilian intelligence officer carrying a gun wearing a uniform. I'm not a uniformed service member. In fact, I took leave from my Coast Guard unit, my military unit, to go fight in the war in Iraq. What I got my disability benefits for was my Coast Guard service, because I was engaged in violent work, body recovery, you know, doing boardings, yeah. those kinds of things. Um, and that was what uh entitled me to my benefits you know if i if i had come to them and said hey i was traumatized in iraq they'd be like great you were working for the khaki corporation what do you you know what, what do you expect money from us for even though it was in service to a military uh um 
uh, in, in a military engagement. But what was actually written, it took me years to get my VA benefits. I fought the VA for ages. Um, but what was so affirming about that process is that the, the VA's process of investigating your disability and affirming it, confirming it, to make absolutely sure this is a real thing, eliminated all question, you know, like, because that's what happens when you have a mental health issue is there's always a voice in the back of your head saying, am I making this up? Am I just being weak? You know, is well, you, this real? You, you know? think about it, you, you know, the, the, the pat answer, well, it's all in your head. Yeah. yeah but that doesn't mean it's not, no. you know, a diagnosable problem, you know, right. because it's all in my head. And right. I, you, so I understand exactly what you were saying. You know, what you, you mentioned uh, before that you had written an article for Combat Stress Magazine for, for the American Institute of Stress. And one of the things in the article you stated make, made me, like, stop. You said PTSD is a lot like autism. And I thought, oh, that's, that's very interesting. Tell, tell us what you mean by that. So uh, I... Full disclosure, I have a nephew who's nonverbal autistic. He's a way, you know, autism, as you know, is a spectrum. And we have some people that are highly functional. He's nonverbal at the right. way at one end of the spectrum. Um, and one of the things that's been so surprising to me, you know, interacting with the world of autism is how little we know about it. You know, yeah. people don't really know what it is uh, in many cases. Um, and there's certainly a lot of research and, and study being done of it. Uh, about it. But the truth is, how does it happen? When does it happen? What is it really? What's going on in the brain? What's going on in the body? It's not really understood. Um, and the same thing I think is true of PTSD. And the best example of that I can think of is, you know, here we have the Armed Forces Network, and they are doing a campaign trying to get soldiers to get help. And they are advertising this experience. Remember what I described before, the sudden traumatic flash. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this commercial thinking, this has nothing to do with me. This isn't PTSD. This is not what I'm experiencing. Right. And when I talked about my experience with PTSD, which I described in the article as saying, this isn't a pathology. It's not a disease, it's a worldview. My perspective on the world has shifted permanently. Yep. And it's not going to shift back. And it still hasn't shifted back. Um, I talked to some people I know, people I've been downrange with. And they're like, man, I don't know what you're talking. I'm experiencing something else. So the point is just like autism. So, and, and autism is such a broad uh, category that it's a spectrum, right? right. My, if you met my nephew and you met Temple Grandin, who's probably one of the most famous autistic people in the world, you would Elon be like, Musk. yeah, sure. You'd be like, right. Perfect example. You met Elon Musk and then you met my nephew. You'd be like, how do you tell me that these two people are dealing with the same condition? There's no way. Um, and the truth and, and part of why we have to cast such a wide net is that we really we don't know. Yeah. We really don't know. And that's important uh, to uh, also PTSD. I find in my, in my personal case, it only manifests certain times, mm -hmm. you, you know, so like I got real good at not putting myself in that position. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and, and as, as time went by, I learned to manage it better and better and better. And, you know, it's just, so yeah. it's, 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 it's I thought that was very interesting that you said, because it is like a spectrum. It, it really yes. is. And you also said um, that PTSD isn't a disease. It's a worldview, like, like you just mentioned. And I thought, man, that was very insightful because it does change the way you look at things. It's something normal that no one else would be feel, feel it's a, it, let's call it a trigger. Um, that would trigger your PTSD symptoms. Why would that do it? But, well, because they don't understand. Because yeah. your worldview has changed. Yes. Yeah. And the, and the other thing for, for me is also, and that's really critical, because if you think that this thing is a sudden flash disease, well, does it, you treat diseases, you give medicine, you yeah. when you're dealing with a shift in perspective, you're not going to treat it in an acute fashion. And, and, and the thing that's really tough is when you first are coming to grips with this thing and you're trying to talk to people about it and they're trying to talk you out of it, right? Oh, you're, you're being morbid, you're being negative. And it's like, 
no, <laughs> this is who I am, right? right? And, and invalidating my whole perspective on the world is even more isolating, which is one of the real, that is one thing I think that's pretty consistent across all PTSD sufferers, I know, is that sense of isolation. The and people just, that I, I'm sorry. No problem. The, the people that I've talked to that PTSD, uh, I, I get very frustrated. Because they're trying to tell somebody why they're feeling a certain way. And it doesn't make sense to someone who's not suffering from it. Yeah. And you're never going to be able to really explain why would it's like, you know, oh, why sh that shouldn't bother you? You know, well, yeah, yeah right. I mean, I, I agree, but it does like and I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it, people have more understanding of, of now they have more understanding of PTSD than they, they did in the past. And that's a help. I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, I was chatting with a friend of mine uh, and I was, you know, on some terror that was definitely trauma fueled. And he goes, I remember he kept saying to me, what are you upset about? All your bills are paid. And he kept saying, you own your own home. I was a homeowner and I paid off my apartment, which is, Actually, in America, that's quite an achievement. Yeah. Um, and I and he was, and of course, those things are wonderful. But what he couldn't understand was, dude, you want me to get excited about owning a home? I was just on a battlefield, right? right? Like I just had the power of life and death over other people. I just, you know, had the ability to save people's lives. And now you want me to get excited about a house? <laughs> I don't think so. Like that's okay. not reassuring to me. Um, but like, how do you explain that to somebody? You well, know? like you said, your your view of things have your perspective has changed. You know, it's it's because it should be exciting yeah. to own a house, especially your first. I mean, it should be exciting. It should be that that you stress that we all want looking for, but it's all tempered by your past experience. When when I got back, uh, I think it was my second or third tour. I'll never forget this. I literally been off the plane for like a few hours and I got taken to this restaurant in Alexandria, Virginia. And I think I had hit the deck as a phalanx went off because there were riots coming in like, like literally the day before. And, and I'll never get the waiter comes out and is talking about butter pairings. So the which bread went with which butter. This was like, I can't remember the name. It's the old, probably still there. It's on King Street in Old Town Alexandria. And I'm looking at this guy and I want to kill it. Like, I'm just like, what is wrong with you that you give a damn about what yeah. bread goes with what, but what, what planet are you on? And mm -hmm. then of course, th and this is the worst part is that's followed by this intense self-loathing because you're immediately disconnected. These people are here to welcome me back. They were worried while I was gone and I'm angry at them because they're trying to take me to a nice place to eat. And I can't even understand why I'm angry. You see what I mean? Yes, and like, course. it's just this incredibly, and then of course, but what follows that, at least for me, was just this intense fatigue. Yes. It's just like, I can't understand. I don't have the energy. I just want to lie down, you know, and frankly, lie down and die. You know, yeah. that was, that was what it was. And that was like day one back. It's not uncommon. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I appreciate you sharing all that with us because the, there are people listening to this podcast who are suffering and they don't think there's an out. And if you are watching, there is an out. Look at Mike. He's well, doing okay. He's doing let, okay. Me, let me modify that. This is really important uh, because it, I want to tell everyone the truth. There isn't an out. As far as my perspective, there is a way to live where you are. Which is um, really what I meant. And, and I love the title of your podcast. Yeah. Um, because people always talk, well, I want you to be happy. And we'll get to, maybe we'll get to Buddhist, some of my Buddhist experience later. Happiness is not my goal. Right. Because happiness comes and goes. And when it goes, you want more of it. But I love the term contentment. I love the term peace. And, and, and it and is obtainable. Uh, yes. Even if you're suffering, if you're suffering from um, some of the disorders that PTSD can cause, if you're, you know, there there are ways. Yes. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about those ways. Mm -hmm. Some of the more common coping mechanisms that people can use to help manage their symptoms of PTSD. So the, the two, 
the, 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 the one traditional one, which is the core, and I'll give you my whole journey. Um, uh, but the, the one traditional one, which is where, where you're always advised to do is talk to someone. That is where you start. Um, and it, there are two major branches. And one is psychotherapy or talk therapy, which, is, which are conversations that you have with a trained LCSW, licensed clinical social worker, licensed mental health counselor. And I apologize for the emojis that are coming up. <laughs> Doom is automatic. It's copying your, 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 yeah, my your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, so uh, licensed mental health counselor, uh, a clinical social worker, I always, a uh, psychologist. And it is what you think it is. You come in a room and you talk about your feelings and your experience. And good therapists, in my experience, they do very little talking. They ask you questions and they keep you talking. Yeah. And you wind up answering your own questions and, and, and dealing with it that way. That is really, really tough for warfighters and first responders because by and large, we're not big talkers. And my background is unusual for a warfighter. I come from a highly educated Jewish suburban liberal family that we're talking about our feelings was something that we always did. So I will freely admit that I have an advantage mm -hmm. that some of my friends, including some of my friends I lost to suicide, did not have. Um, but I will say this to those listeners who are the strong silent types, and there are many of them. This is where you start. It really is. And that if you want some relief from this thing, and I'll say this, look, we are experts at walking into discomfort. When I fight a fireman, I put on 80 pounds of gear. Right. The sweat, I got a vapor barrier and there's a lot letting my sweat out. I'm, I, that, that's before I pick up my axe and my halligan or, or however many pounds of hose line I'm pulling oh, in that hose, burning yeah. building, right? So if I can do that discomfort and you can do the discomfort that you dealt with as a vet or a first responder, and if, I, I don't want to exclude anybody, I'm just speaking to my own community here. Right. You can go through the discomfort of talking to somebody. That is where you start. Um, and if you do not have insurance or you do not have money, there are lots of nonprofits who will help you. Yes. And Wounded Warrior will help you. Got Your Six will help you. And if you simply Google resources for PTSD, um, free resources for PTSD, charity resources for PTSD, you will find foundations out there. And I'm sure the American Institute of Stress has resources. We do. Um, that they can help connect you to. Right. We have and a lot of... Uh resources and information and places to go to and, and we sh we try always to update it as much as we can and you know it's it's very interesting what you're saying that talk therapy is very helpful um i agree with that i'm a i'm still a big believer in talk therapy for for maybe a different reason than other people not just being stoic but my deal was is um i've seen some bad stuff um, as an ex-cop, and I never, ever wanted to put those images in somebody else's head. Mm. So I never wanted to share that because mm. to this day, I've never told my wife or my daughter or anybody the, the, some of the things I've seen. That's why you need to go see a professional. Mm -hmm. a dis nothing else, you're paying them to listen. Disinterested. This is the key point. Disinterested right. Right. third party. Oh, I talked to my friends. Oh, I talked to my girlfriend. No, yeah, those people back. have a dog in the fight. Right. And I'll, and I'll tell you this. I love that you brought it up this way. I didn't want to put this image in someone else's head. How about this? How about I did something yeah. that is so horrible that I can't admit it to my wife, that I don't want my friends to know. You know, that's the bigger deal. The issue for me is actually less what I've seen. The issue for me is what I've done <laughs> to other people. Um, and I think that that's the case uh, with a lot of um, PTSD sufferers. And when you have a disinterested third party, a therapist yes. who doesn't, they don't care about you. They're doing their job. And of course they care about you. It's a compassionate profession, but you know what I mean? Yes. Then you can say, Hey, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> I went right through a door. He was there. I was there and I couldn't even get to my gun. And uh, I had to, I had to do the job man, right. you know, like that kind of a thing. I and, and, things. And sometimes you got to, you know, and for me, you know, as a targeting officer, it was always like, man, you know, I saw it was on that floor camera. I knew how many people were in that room. And I said, send it. That's what I said. I did it. You know, yeah, I worked that target. It was your job. It was my job. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. but in retrospect, of course, who cares? It was my job. Right. I could have gotten up and said, I'm not doing this job. This job is wrong. But I did. Yeah. Right. And uh, and you got to live with that. What about other um Therapeutic approaches. Right. So, all right. So we start with talk therapy. Right. Then I move to 
what I call traditional medication. Um, and this is, these are medications prescribed to you by a psychiatrist. Um, and uh, SSRIs are the most common family that are uh, prescribed. These are things like Prozac. These are things, um, uh, well, Butrin. Yeah, well, Butrin, yeah. Uh, right. These are things like, and some of them are ones you take every day. And some of them are ones you take as needed, Ambien, clonazepam. Um, but uh, I want to be clear. These have side effects. Um, and unfortunately for the largely male population of PTSD sufferers, those side effects are often destruction of libido, impotence. Um, and, uh, you know, it's tough. And a lot of people don't want to take them for those reasons. Uh, you know, for me, uh, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy being plain, um, the, the death of my libido that came from... Um, you know, it's, I don't have to worry about impotence. I just didn't want to have sex at all. Mm -hmm. It felt like a kind of death. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't realize how important your sexual life and your romantic life, even if you're single, is. You know, you think, all right, well, if that part it's of the way you define it's one of the ways you define yourself as a person, right. as a man or a woman, you know, how you just interact with the world. Yeah. You, know, you know, even forget your romantic relationships with women being out with other men and they're talking yeah. about their romantic life and you literally feel nothing. Uh, it's a it's a it's a kind of zombification. So I can describe it. Now it's preferable to suicide, um, and I certainly and also that doesn't happen to everyone. There are plenty of people who take these medications. Right. I'm talking about my personal experience. But be, and, and also this: when you take medications, you can have breakthroughs. They work for a year and then they stop working. They work for two years and then they stop working. Hmm. Um, so in my personal experience, and I'm speaking only of myself. I found medications, traditional medications, to be of limited effectiveness, um, but not to say they were not effective, and the side effects to be, to shift my suffering from what I was dealing with the PTSD to what I was dealing with with the medication. Now, I want to be clear. I know plenty of people who have tremendous success with traditional medicine, and I don't want to steer listeners away from it. I'm only trying to be honest about my personal experience. Right. So. And sometimes it's a temporary thing. Um, I remember... Um, it being cold. Well, it's just like you broke your foot. It's a crutch for right now to help yeah. you get around. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, yeah, you know, but you might, but you might not need your crutches forever. That's that's true, and I, and that certainly was true for me. I was yeah. on medications for many years, um, and now I haven't taken traditional medications now for four years or something like that. Which leads me to the next step on the path, um, which will probably turn off a lot of listeners and that's psychedelic drugs, um, which are mostly illegal. Uh, and there is certainly a revolution, particularly in the United States of legalization. Um, and there's just the science on the effectiveness of psychedelics for treating PTSD is irrefutable. I'm talking major peer reviewed journals and doctors all over the world. And it's something crazy like traditional medications have something like a 30% success rate. Psychedelics have a 60 or 70% success rate, including people who do psychedelics once and are literally cured. It's just done. Um, now that was certainly not my experience. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I specifically am talking about two psychedelic drugs. Again, and I wanna be clear to your listeners, these are illegal. Um, it is against the law to do this, uh, but uh, and I certainly would never encourage anybody to break the law, but the law is really stupid and it's getting people killed and it needs to change faster. And it makes and, me really And angry. you said there's scientific evidence. Oh my God. And, so well, that it is effective. effective. It's incredibly effective. And it's also, it's on the road to decriminalization. And in fact, it's medically legal. You know, ketamine is now medically legal in many places. Uh, MDMA is. Uh, so if you're interested in the laws of psychedelics and how to get treatment and resources, you should check out the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Science MAPS, M-A-P-S. And if you Google them, there's, and they have limitless outreach. They are desperate to help people uh, with PTSD. So those resources are there. And if you want to strongly you, suggest doing some research before yeah. you just go ahead and try it. No, no. It's, it's not something you just go ahead and try. Yeah. So I want to be clear. Psychedelic drugs, like traditional prescribed medication, are risky. And you should not just go do them. <laughs> um, uh, so, but I, but if you want to do them to be in a medical environment to get treatment and not go to jail, MAPS will help you. So do it that way. Okay. The two uh, medications that I've had incredible success with are MDMA, which is a, unfortunately a party drug known as ecstasy and psilocybin, which is the psychoactive component mushrooms. in mushrooms. Yes. Right. Um, and, uh, 
this was truly a magic switch. I, I just can't describe it to you. It was literally, I, I found a guide, uh, a psychedelic guide who is a licensed psychotherapist, a PhD psychotherapist who does this on the side because they want to help people. Um, we were connected through a network. Uh, this person uh, did traditional psychotherapy with me for months. And I kept saying, just give me the drugs, give me the drugs. Mm. I'm not doing that. You're not ready. Uh, they wanted to get to a point where they felt that the set and setting, which is to say my uh, headspace was at a point where I would get real benefit from it. And then we went and we did the session and I went into that session, one person and I came out another. Uh, and it was just one of the things to remember, um, these drugs work differently. MDMA. So the, the default mode network of the brain, the amygdala, which is our fight or flight response in the brain is it's necessary. It's keeping us from getting eaten by a bear, right? Like we need that but it's not very good at keeping us happy. No. Um, and what MDMA does is it quiets that fight or flight response. Mm. And so you are able to screaming stops for long enough and you can actually, and remember my psychedelic guide, and I certainly recommend that you work with a guide. These are professionals who do this full time. Um, and again, maps can help you get connected to one. Um, and also just like a therapist, you need to really make sure you have a, good guide who is competent because there are plenty of charlatans out there. Um, I was very, uh, I certainly interviewed my guide just like they, uh, they interviewed me. Um, and uh, so here I am. Uh, I did this outside in the woods um, with eyes open. Some guides like to work with um, patients being blindfolded. Uh, for me, the natural setting in the sunlight was incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, having my amygdala shut down and be quieted, allowed me in the screaming stopping, allowed me to now talk to this therapist without being scared and without hmm. having my defenses up and really look at what was going on in my life. And then what psilocybin does is, how do I explain this? Depression and, and is an actual physical phenomenon in the brain. Think about like ruts being carved in ice because skis have gone through them so many times. And, uh, Psilocybin is like throwing the snow up in the air so that the ruts get covered over and you can find new pathways. But those new pathways are physical. Your brain changes and it changes permanently. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that shift in perspective, how do I describe this? And people think of psilocybin as, oh, you're, oh man, the colors, I'm hallucinating. Right. It was it not like, it's not yeah. what it's like. <laughs> um, the, to give you an example, um, when we started our session, myself and my guy, this is one of the most moving experiences I've ever had in my life. We were at the edge of a pond and it was incredibly murky and muddy. And I knew there were frogs in the pond, but I thought, you know, there's 10 or 20. You could see them, you know, moving around. And I, take, I do these medicines and we're, we're having a therapy session this whole time, you know, talking and talking. And I turn back to the pond and I freeze and I turn to my guy and I go, how many frogs can you see? And she goes, 10. There were thousands. Hmm. And I wasn't hallucinating. It was because my eyes were so dilated hmm. that the light was penetrating all through the mud and I could see. And that became this. And then because the psilocybin had activated my prefrontal cortex, I was able to grasp that metaphor. But like in a soul deep way that like oh my god mike it's how you're looking at life you you thought this pond was cloudy but it isn't you thought there were 10 frogs but there are a thousand what else are you wrong about they made a connection saying? yeah right what else are you not seeing and that just shifted the gears and they never shifted back well, that, that, you know that's very interesting it's, it's I, I hadn't thought about that um, and I don't know anything about the use of it as for treatment for PTSD. And, and, and I'm really glad that you gave us some, a place for people to get information about it. Um, it's certainly something that exists, but it is something like anything else that, like Mike said, like any other drug you take and you better find out about it because, um, God knows there are drugs out there that we all don't react the same to. Oh no, I want to be I want to be absolutely clear. These these drugs are illegal 
and they are dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they, and they, and you, if you, if they are to be used, they have to be used under medical supervision and they have to be used safely. So stepping aside from the, uh, the drug stuff and the therapist, um, one of the things we talk about often, just dealing with stress in general, but certainly for PTSD is, you know, learning relaxation techniques. Um, did you find learning those kind of techniques and, or did you use relaxation techniques such as? Sure. Breathing sure. So, so I actually disagree here. Um, I, because PTSD is so intensely individual for some people attempting to relax makes it worse. Hmm. Um, and I've certainly okay. met people like that. Um, for some people burning themselves out helps. Um, hmm. uh, it's an incredibly individual. Um, I do find for the majority of people, relaxation works, but <clears throat> For me, it was never relaxation, but this also brings me to my next step on the path, which is that I discovered the Dharma and became a very devout Buddhist. And at the core of Buddhism is meditation, seated meditation. Now, plenty of people who are not Buddhists meditate, and, and meditation is a very profound relaxation technique. So what's ironic here is I'm, I'm telling you I don't really like relaxation techniques, and here I am doing what is considered one. But for me, meditation is not relaxation. For me, meditation is, and I practice in the Soto Zen tradition. We do what's called Zazen, which is sitting meditation, where you are simply sitting with your eyes closed and you are following your breath in and out. And all you are doing is trying to keep your attention on your breath, that's all. And of course, that's incredibly hard. And thoughts arise that I leave the oven on. Oh, I, I saw this attractive person. Oh, this person's cut me off on the drive. What a jerk. Or, oh, gosh, I, I, I have to pay that bill. And when those thoughts arise, I just go, oh, there's my mind. How active. We're going to come back to the breath. And that process of focusing my attention on my breath and being satisfied with just my breath brings me into the present moment. What's here right now? I don't have to worry about paying that bill. I don't have to worry about that guy who cut me off in traffic. And you can, of course, expand it. I don't have to worry about what I did in Iraq. And I don't have to worry about what that makes me. Right now, right here, there is my breath in and out. And that has been as transformative as psychedelics. Yeah. It's been it's funny, you know, I, I talk to uh, younger people every once in a while when they're willing to listen to me. <laughs> um, and I was very impressed by the amount of 20 year old something year olds that actually meditate oh yeah it's, it's I, on I, the who knew like yeah. you know i did not i did not think <laughs> you know we have this preconceived notion of what their generation is like i did not think that that was a thing with them but it is uh, my daughter is telling me she does it too yeah, you know, well, I mean, she's 24. Yeah. Buddhism is, is it's not a religion. Everyone calls it one, but it is the fastest going religion that isn't a religion uh, right. in the country. And, and as far as meditation, working for oh, a whole bunch of things, they've been doing it for 5,000 years. <laughs> you know. Well, but, but I want to be clear on one thing. Sure. There are plenty of cases where that stillness is really, really bad for people right. with PTSD. So when we come to techniques, you know, again, I've talked already about psychotherapy. I've talked about traditional medication. I've talked about psychedelic drugs. And now I'm talking about Buddhism. These are things that have been effective for me. But I'm so glad that you brought up that comparison with autism. Mm -hmm. PTSD is an extremely broad field of, of, of symptoms right. and, and effects. And it's very important that you manage your own care. And if someone is telling you to meditate, you need to relax. But when you sit down, you are exploding in panic or something don't do that <laughs> no don't do that Liz. find another way yeah and i i tell people you know when i tell you to relax i don't mean sit in a chair and just veg out for me the thing that's most relaxing most zen like is riding my motorcycle yep. on a back road yep through, through okay i live in florida so i the, the greatest thing you can do for me and again it's me is riding through the orange groves when the flowers are blossoming now you're That's riding wonderful. through that that intense orange blossom smell on your motorcycle wow. 
and, and being part of the environment, it's very Zen-like. I have to snap myself out of it sometimes because I am riding a motorcycle. No, so but that's, I, that's I, so wonderful. And also, where are you in Florida? Is that Sarasota or? South Florida. Nice. So, yeah. so uh, but that's a great example. Okay? Yeah. So here, here, and I love this example of the orange probes because, and I love the natural world as a locus for the present moment. Because mm -hmm. when you are smelling those oranges and feeling those wind, that wind on you, you are nowhere else. You are yes. not at war. You are not on the job. You are on that bike. You, you know, and that is the heart of the Buddhist proposition. I, you know, and I'm so thrilled that you, you, you gave that example. For me, yeah. it's incredible. I have these experiences firefighting. I was in a truck company operations class just last month and we're cutting a roof. So you, you vent vertically by cutting a, cutting a hole in the roof. So I am on this roof ladder trying to balance myself with this giant 45-pound chainsaw with smoke pouring up all around me, cutting this gap in the roof. And the need to focus, because I don't want to cut myself with this chainsaw, mm -hmm. um, and the need to focus on what I'm doing is keeping me present. And in, in the midst of like this muscular discomfort and fatigue and trying to keep balanced and, and worry, am I going to fall? And the groaning of this chainsaw and the instructor yelling at me. And you would think that is the opposite of meditation. And yeah. I was wholly present. Sure. Your focus present. is awakened to the optimum degree. Sure. And I got down off that roof feeling rested. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk to you about something else. We talked about a whole bunch of stuff here and uh, we all know that you're a writer and May I say a very good one? Thank you. Uh, I, look, sci-fi is my thing. I love sci-fi okay. and the other things that you are. So um, I wanted to ask you, because it's come up before as a, as a way of, that's very therapeutic to people, and that's journaling and writing in general. Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you feel about that? Do you think I it could be therapeutic for PTSD? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I, and I, I, in fact, uh, used to, help out with a nonprofit called Words After War. We did this very thing where we helped uh, uh, veterans deal with it by writing. What is so fascinating to me, now, to be clear, I haven't done fiction. My last novel came out in 2020. I'm doing history now, right? Uh, military history, not, not surprisingly. Um, but uh, every book I've ever written, every novel I've ever written, I come back to it later and uh, see that I was working something out um, in that without knowing. There's a, my, 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 uh, Seventh novel, gosh, I can't believe I'm saying this. My seventh novel, The Armored Saint, there's a scene in which um, the protagonist has a falling out with her best friend who she's in love with. And, you know, she embarrasses herself and she's being comforted in the woods by her um, uncle. He's not really her uncle, but, and he's saying to her, love is always worth it. Love is, you know, even when you get hurt, you know, you should, it's worth risking. And the fact that you're willing to risk shows that you're a good person. And it wasn't until years later that I was like, wow, I wrote that while my relationship with my girlfriend was falling apart. <laughs> and and I was talking to out. myself, you right. know. Right. So I think it is an excellent, excellent idea. Yep. Um, and I highly, highly encourage it. The problem is not everyone's a writer. No. And not everyone, that doesn't work for everyone. But yes, I think it's an excellent, excellent exercise. Awesome. Okay. We're, we're getting long on time. And I, I want to cover a couple of things. One is that... Um, the groups out there or forums specifically for individuals with PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of some that our listeners can, they can go to? So the, you mentioned the, Wounded Warrior, who I have had yeah, a Wounded relationship Warrior, with. of course, is one. Yeah. Yava is another great one. The VA, if you're a veteran, has a lot of great resources. Got Your Six is an excellent one, although it's focused on, on the media. There, um, uh, but the, the truth is, I did not really interface uh, mm -hmm. with those groups. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly any kind of quick Google search right. is going to help uh, connect you with those groups. And, and, and we also have a, a couple, I think, uh, at uh, stress.org that you can find in groups that you can, and reading combat stress magazine, um, not only writing about uh, your experiences, but reading about other people's experiences. I did my thesis in bibliotherapy and oh, wow. reading about other people's experiences and, and understanding that, Hey, you're not alone. Yeah. yeah. Their, their experiences are different than yours. But you're, you're not alone. And I think the most important thing that we could come away with today is don't be alone. But yes. the, you, there's a lot of different things you could do. God, we've discussed a whole bunch of them today. But there's yeah. one thing you should never do. And that's nothing. 
Yes. Because if you do nothing, nothing is going to change. It's the definition of insanity, right? Well, but it's even scarier than that. And this is one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things I finally had to admit to myself, and I remember saying this to a friend, is that I have the mental health equivalent of terminal cancer. Mm. And if I don't treat it, I will die. Period. Um, and it's the same thing. Like, this is serious. Um, mm. And only you can know, you know, how, how, how bad things are. But this is the problem with hidden or invisible disabilities when we call mental health problems. Yeah. This will kill you as surely as if you have a stage four tumor in your lung, if you leave it alone. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people fail to appreciate is that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm unhappy, but I'll, you know, I'll be all right. right. No, dude, you won't. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's why we need to get help. And, and, and at the American Institute of Stress, it's like one of our main goals is to educate people and take away the stigma that you're having a problem. So if you're if you're if you're dealing with a lot of stresses, don't wait till it becomes a diagnosable problem. Yep. You know, don't don't wait. Change change some things. Do some things. All right. Last thing before we go, God, we Sorry. could talk. We could talk for a long time. Man. I mean, you, I you're you We haven't even covered like you know half the stuff I'd love to talk about. But, That's a problem. Um, I want to ask you for your personal stress or PTSD management tool. What do you do when it's starting to make you a little, right, a so, little uneasy? You know what I mean. You feel yeah, like, and this, this is going to be tough for some of your listeners because uh, that's why it's your Buddhist. personal one. Yeah, I'm a Buddhist. Yeah. I have a I have a spiritual path, um, and Buddhism. One of the things I love about Buddhism is that the Abrahamic faiths of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are things you believe. Mm -hmm. Buddhism is a practice. It's something you do. Um, and there are techniques and methods that we do. But the whole focus uh, of, the, of the Dharma is the present moment and being with what is. Neither grasping for things you want, nor pushing things you don't want away. And learning to be with what is here right now. And that, for me... It has been life-saving and life-changing. It has been so profound that I've reoriented my whole life. I'm, right. I'm a student chaplain uh, in Buddhism with a goal of taking a massive pay cut to go into bringing the Dharma, hopefully into the VA hospital system or other first responder or veteran organizations full time. Well, um, because the Dalai Lama say, live your life like a dog because no one lives in the moment like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, Pet a dog, they're happy, even though you yelled at them 10 minutes ago. I have two, and I have two, and they are very present creatures. They're very That's present. Absolutely true, yeah. But, but the thing that always I always struggle when I say that to people, you know, people always say, you know, how did you do it? You know, how have you, because Buddhism didn't just save my life, it transformed it. You know, I say, well, this, but when you're talking about a spiritual path and a faith tradition, that turns a lot of people off. A lot of people aren't up for that. You know, this is, a, we live in a, a really secular time. So I, I realize that that's a dissatisfying answer to some people, but it's well, the honest That's why I wanted to know what your personal go-to was for your stress management. Yeah. And having faith in spirituality is a very valid answer. Yeah, oh, well, that's the yeah. answer for me. All right. Hey, Mike, I really want to thank you for taking the time and talking with us today. This is a really important topic. Uh, I have multiple friends who have suffered from PTSD and... Um, I think it, it deserves a lot more conversation. I wish we could talk for an hour, but unfortunately we have constraints of time yeah, course, like course. everything else. But I really appreciate all that you've brought to the table today, man. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. pleasure. This is such a it's such an opportunity to reach out to others. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for also for, for writing for us. I hope you'll do it again. Oh, it's my Same pleasure. For combat oh, yeah, I, I, and I for contentment. It. Yeah, thanks. You know. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us today. This has been your host, Will Heckman. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. But don't forget, please follow this podcast and and hit the subscribe button, please. You know, I appreciate that. Remember, your support helps us to, to go to stress.org. And I want to remind everyone, just as stress is different, and for each of us, just as we discussed, Mike and I, there's no one stress reduction or one management strategy that is right for everyone. And so that means you need to join us next time where we explore more stress management techniques and insights. And I'm very once again to visit us at stress.org. And I hope that all the stuff that you heard from Mike and myself today will help you find contentment. It's a good day, everyone. Thanks.